Ever wondered how this, the SU carb works? Well, stay tuned to find out. Welcome back to the Lomifa Classic. And if you're new to the channel, I hope they stick around and consider subscribing. I put new videos every week on Jaguar related content. So hit the subscribe button and the bell notification to not miss any updates. Now on to today's topic, the SU carburetor. Chances are that if you've had a British car or been around British cars, you've heard of the SU carburetor, seen one, or possibly owned a car with one. This happens to be an HD6. It's off a 1966 Jaguar Mark II 3.8 liter straight six. It has two of these. But most SU carburetors basically work in the same way. So I was showing how this works and it basically transfers to the other models as well. The only things that really change is how the float bowl is situated, how the connection is done down here if it's done via metal like this or via hose, or if the float bowl gets moved underneath instead. Otherwise, they're all basically the same. Uh, SU carburetors work on the constant depression design, which basically means that there is a variable venturi in here that's controlled by this piston that moves up and down like so, and that's how they all work. The orientation can be different. This is one that's supposed to be orientated on the side as a side draft, on certain vehicles, they're orientated a bit at an angle, like on the Rover V8. So let's head on over to the bench. I'll show you how they work inside, what's so brilliantly simple about them, why I think they're one of the best carburetor designs ever in their simplicity and how reliable they are. And we'll just go through some common things that can go wrong with these as well. So let's head on over to the workbench and have a look at this one inside. Before we go through the inner workings of an SU carb, I thought we'd just do a brief history check. The SU carb was invented by Herbert Skinner in 1904, hence the name SU Skinner Union. His younger brother Carl sold the company to W.R. Morris in 1918 after he perfected the designs of it. Morris then sold it to his car company, Morris Motors, in 1936, and that's also when the name of the company changed to the SU Carburetor Company Limited. And that's basically how we know SU today. Until 1996, it was bought then by Berlin Fuel Systems Limited. So if you ever rebuilt one of these carbs recently, chances are you got a rebuild kit by Berlin Fuel Systems who owns the SU carburetor names. Uh, they were used in most British cars and some Swedish like Volvo and Saab as well. The last cars to use SU carburetors was the Mini and the Maestro of 1993. So that's a giant lifespan, almost 90 years of SU carbs. So that just proves once again, what a great carburetor they are. This is an HD model we're going through here. Later came the HS where there was a fuel line here instead of the metal here at the bottom. And then there was the HIF, the horizontal integral float. Basically it had a bigger base down here. The float chamber was moved underneath the carb and everything was just in one unit. So here's the carb all together before we take it apart. This is the part that goes against the intake manifold. Here is where you'd have some air cleaners. This is the float bowl. So you have a float inside here. So fuel comes in through here, goes up, then travels through here up into the carburetor. This is the dash pot. Then the piston travels up and down in here. Here you have a little place to open to fill oil. Here's a damper, basically a shock absorber. Without this, the piston will travel up way too quickly when you open the throttle. So this basically just holds that in place a little longer and also makes it not fall down as fast. I'll show more of that when we take off the top. The top goes off really easily. It's just three screws along the side. And they're really great SU cars because you can't put the tops back in the wrong way. They only fit one way on the side of the carb. However, the dash pots are machined with the pistons. So if you take these apart and you have two of them, don't mix them up. The piston is machined to fit only this dash pot and no other ones. So you can't change the dash pot from one to the other. They need to go back on the right carburetor. That's very important when you're rebuilding these. So you lift the top here. There is a big spring. 
Move that to the side. This is what the dash pot looks like inside. Here is that piston that moves up and down. It's where you have the oil in there. And then this damper fits in there and gets a snug fit when there's oil in there. Here is the needle. As you can see, it's tapered. So it's thinner at the bottom and thicker at the top. Here is the jet, the orifice in there. Let's see if I can open up like there. You can see it sits down here in the bottom of the carburetor. Let's take off this top here and I'll show you the float bowl. So there's that lid. And here is a brass float in here. Later carburetors use a plastic one instead. It's basically just a flotation device. And there is the float chamber or the float bowl. So how does all this work on your car? Let's pretend the whole carb is back together. I just put the piston in to show, but let's pretend everything is back together. This is on your car and it's running. So right now your car is idling, the throttle's closed. But let's say you take off really quickly and you give it full throttle. Now it's open all the way here. And as you know, an engine running creates a lot of vacuum. So you have a great suction going in here, but the piston is down because it's atmospheric pressure over here. So the change in pressure will lift this piston up. As it lifts up, fuel will vaporize here and spray into the car or into the engine. So the higher the piston lifts, the more fuel and air can get into the engine. So the reason why the needle is tapered, when it's down here at idle speed, the needle is the fattest in the orifice, so a small amount of fuel can get out. The higher it goes up, the thinner part of the needle is in the orifice, and that means the more fuel can go in. So when it's up all the way like this, the needle is as thin as possible, and the most amount of fuel can go through. And since the piston is up as well, the most amount of air can go through as well, so you have the correct air fuel ratio to go into the engine. Well, then you might be wondering, how do you set the fuel mixture? Well, the fuel mixture is set by moving the jet down there up and down. And that's done here on the side. So this little rod here, when you change this, can move the needle up and down. Everything's a little bit seized on this carburetor because I haven't uh, restored it or anything. But on a working carburetor where everything's restored, when you push this up and down, you can see that moving up and down, but I'll take the bottom off later and I'll show you how the jet there moves up and down. So how does the fuel get into the carburetor? Of course there's a fuel pump, it can be mechanical or electrical. Fuel supply comes up to this banjo bolt here, travels down in here, and it comes through here. This is known as the needle and seat. So when this is down, basically the float is then at the bottom this chamber because the chamber is empty and fuel will pour down here. As the float goes up you will shut off that valve and it will stop the flow of fuel because otherwise this whole thing would just overflow and overfuel the engine or just pour fuel all over the ground and then as you're using fuel the float will go down, the flow of fuel will continue again, pour into the float chamber, the float will go up again and shut off the fuel. So it just works up and down all the time like this. If this little valve here, the needle and seat, if it's faulty or you get dirt in there, then your float will just, or your float chamber will overflow. So it will flow out through the top here or through an overflow hose on some other carburetors, go straight onto the ground. Or if that doesn't happen, you will just overfuel by putting fuel in here and you'll just overfuel the engine and possibly uh, stall it. So that is a common issue on all carburetors, not only SUs, to make sure that these are working correctly and don't have any dirt in here. Off camera I just removed the four bolts that holds the float bowl in place. It also holds this in place, which is what adjusts the mixture up and down. It's just a pair of forks that go, let's see if I can get it back, goes in here and adjusts this up and down. So I thought it would just be easier to show with all that off. 
So here's the orifice. So here's where all the fuel goes up and into the orifice or the jet. If you have a look at it inside and I push it up, I don't know if you could tell, but it went up at least. Now it's all the way up here. So then that is a leaner mixture because it will go further up on the tapered needle. And then if you pull it back down, like so, now it sits below. That will be a richer mixture. So on versions of these carburetors where you have a choke, uh, this car has an automatic choke, which is a completely different topic. I'll go through that in a separate video. But on carburetors that have a manual choke, then the choke lever basically moves this up and down while also increasing engine speed to richen off the carburetor when the car is cold. So what are some of the common issues? Well, of course, these carburetors and most of these cars are getting on to be maybe 40, 50, 60 years old. So a lot of things can go wrong, but many of them can be easily fixed with just a pretty cheap rebuild kit. Some of the common issues are these will start leaking or floats, which means they won't stay up on top like they should, and they won't shut off the uh, flow of fuel up here. They'll be sunken, and then you'll have an overflowing carb. So that's pretty easy to fix. You just replace this, and that solves the issue. It could also overflow, like we said, because the seal in here is bad. Also an easy fix. You can replace that. This has to be set as well to the right float level. That is set incorrectly, that will also overflow. But once again, that's easily fixed. Another thing that could cause them to run incorrectly is that you don't have any oil in here. So if your car accelerates a bit oddly and it feels, let's say lumpy, I'd describe it, you probably don't have any oil in here. So that's easily checked. You should check that pretty often, make sure and to top it up that there's oil in there. Don't put in too much oil because it will just flow down and just get burned off in the engine. But just the right amount to just about the top of here is enough. I've seen some people who have just poured in oil all the way here, basically filled this whole area with oil. And that is very unnecessary. Another issue, like I said before, you could have the wrong piston and the wrong housing and they won't fit tightly. You can hear here. Not sure if you can hear that on camera, but it's a very tight fit. When you push it down, you can feel a rush of air on the side as it pushes down. It's a very, very tight machine fit. That's how it should be. Another issue on some carburetors is that the uh, throttle uh, linkage here, or the, the rod that goes through for the butterfly valve, gets worn out. You can either replace the bushings here on certain models. Certain models, these will have to be drilled out and new bushings put in. And the later ones, they're just rubber ones. So that could be a common vacuum leak on these that get excessively worn. And of course, if you have multiple carburetors, like many cars with SUs, you need to synchronize them. So you have to have the right fuel air mixture on both carbs, and they both need to be set up to bring through the right amount of air or at least the same amount of air on both sides. I won't go through tuning SU carburetor in this video. I will do that in a later video, both on these carbs when they go on this engine, and also um, I'll have another car coming over which also has SU carburetors, and I can show how to tune those. Those are a different type of carbs. That will be interesting to have a look at those as well. That was a basic overview of the SU carburetor. They often get a bad reputation, and I think that's just because they're misunderstood. They're really easy to work on once you understand how they work. Sometimes they could be hard to set up if you have two of them, but with just some basic knowledge and some basic tools, they're really easy to synchronize as well. I will show this in a future video, how to tune SU carburetor. It's not as difficult or as scary as some people think. It's actually pretty easy, I think, to get them to run just right. I will also have a future video of how to restore them. I will rebuild these carbs we went through today. Well, there's another one as well. And the third uh, enrichment device. I'll also go through the Jagger different enrichment devices in the future. So the various AEDs used on um, the Mark II, the S-types, uh, some 420s, 
the Series 1 and the Series 2 XJ6. I will go through all of those in the future because there are a few different versions of those as well. If you liked what you saw, please hit the like button, share this video with your friend. If you're not already subscribed, I highly recommend that you subscribe so you don't miss any future videos. And until next time, I'm Adam and this was Living With A Classic. I'll see you soon.